Thank you, Calvin, and thank you, Tony, uh, to the Architectural League and to Cooper Union. Uh, we'll get right into this because uh, Billy and I have argued over it this, this last weekend and uh, just trying to put together a story that would be comprehensive and yet, uh, uh, I think, hopefully engaging. I think we've got way too much information, so I'm sure Billy will advance the flicker very quickly. But um, first image here is of Dr. Albert Barnes. Many of you know about him, many of you don't. And he uh, grew up poor in Philadelphia, born in 1872. And, and as uh, before the end of the century, or right at about the end of the century, he invented or bought a, a patent to create this stuff called Argorol. And Argorol became a hit. And by the age of, uh, I guess, his early 30s, he became a millionaire. So uh, he developed a, a great interest in art and um, went to Europe um, and also sent his very good friend um, Glackens, a painter, to Europe to buy as much uh, art that he, as he could. And so he amassed this collection and had Paul Cray design a building that would house the collection. Um, the other image of this person that you see here is John Dewey. And John Dewey was very, very influential to Dr. Barnes. Um, he really uh, spoke to Dr. Barnes about this idea of using the art uh, as a way of educating people, that one didn't need to be formally educated in theory or history, that one could really just learn to see. And here is actually an image of uh, Matisse painting one of the cartoons for La Dance. Uh, one of the, I, I, Barnes amassed an extraordinary collection and, and uh, this is in fact the first example of, of a direct installation of a wall mural by, by Matisse. Later began to do giant works uh, after this uh, La Dance or the dance. Um, uh, Barnes was, uh, uh, a difficult person to many. Um, he had very, very strong opinions, and, and in this, I don't know whether you can read it, Billy, you could read it for us, but here he's uh, writing Paul Cray and, and essentially complaining about all those uh, people who actually saw things differently than he did. Uh, clearly, he, was a, he, he, had a, he had a particular uh, point of view with this idea of his art. He also had a very clear point of view relative to society, and he believed that, uh, that people of all ages could be educated uh, equally. So he took uh, the art that he bought to his factory and he would in fact uh, resell it to any person in the factory. He brought the, uh, he, so he ta taught his worker at, at the same cost that he purchased it uh, for. Uh, and then he also tried to bring uh, education into his home and to his collection. He wanted to make sure that all people were educated. He was one of the earliest collectors of uh, African art. Um, uh, amassing an extraordinary collection, which is part of the uh, of the uh, holdings at the Barnes. But I think one of the things he felt very strongly about was connection to uh, a kind of a more common connection to everyday people, and so um, a lot of his anger was directed towards pe the people he considered the elite. An interesting story of uh, James Michener, who also grew up poor, wanted it was difficult to go see the Barnes collection, which we're pointing out here is in. Uh, Lower Marion, uh, uh, outside of Philadelphia, in a, in a suburban area, um, and uh, uh, Michener, who was poor, made an appointment to go see the the, the Barnes. And but he had, was already a student at, at college, and he was turned away uh, because Dr. Barnes found out that uh, he was uh, was being properly educated. Uh, and uh, later, he returned to the Barnes, um, dressed as I think a coal miner, and was let in. Uh, to the collection, and uh, but when he was found out, Barnes then harbored anger against him for the rest of his life. Only after Dr. Barnes died in 1951 in a car accident did Mitchner find out that he was named a trustee of the uh, of the Barnes collection. So he was definitely an irascible person. Um, this aerial uh, shows the um, the actual building where the collection is housed. Um, but you can also see that there are additional outbuildings that are there, both a house where Dr. Barnes lived and administrative um, and support buildings on the rest of the site. So actually, yeah, and, and I should say the site actually was the, home, it was the location of, a, of a, a wonderful estate that was taken down to build this building by Paul Cray and that, uh, Albert Barnes. 
and so the surrounding area of the uh, estate is also is an arboretum. Um, this is the Paul Cray building uh, built and designed in 1922. Um, a very, very uh, sort of stripped down uh, neoclassical facade. This is the, 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 the street entrance. Um, and then these are the plans of the building. Most people think of it as a two-story building. There are 22 galleries on two floors, these two floors, but there's a full basement where there's a rather ratty conservation section, a, a shop and, uh, and uh, storage, uh, all, of, all of which needs a great deal of, of uh, is, is in, and not, not really sufficient to take care of the collection. The collection consists of 20, 2,500 individual objects and over 1,000 paintings. And I should say that there are 181 Renoirs, there are uh, 69 Cezannes, 59 Matisses, 46 Picassos, and so on. Um, here we see in the main gallery the dance, which uh, was executed by uh, Matisse over, I think, two or three years. Uh, windows that face south here are almost always closed, but these look out onto the Arboretum Garden. And one of the extraordinary, you can see that uh, Barnes is always citing this work in, with bilateral symmetry, and we'll look at some of these galleries. When Barnes died, it was said that the paintings could never be moved from the walls as they exist. And so in the, the assignment that we've got was to, in fact, replicate that will, even if this is no longer a tenable site for his work, even if it uh, does not house enough um, spa space and, and facilities to truly educate people, uh, the masses that he wanted to educate, uh, the, the hanging must remain. So this is a, actually in one gallery, just sort of looking at the walls of one room. And you can see that. Um, there were no labels here, uh, Doctor. There are now in cards that one w looks at. But you can see that he's. He's bought enough art that he can, in fact, juxtapose art with hardware also, which he collected and which uh, he had cleaned, probably should not have been cleaned, but this is hardware that uh, was, some of it, quite ancient. And so he balances these walls that he calls an ensemble. This is very, very interesting. We have a Van Gogh here in the corner that's very, very closely sighted next to another painting. So he's actually intending this to be a frontal uh, image of a wall and that the wall turns the corner. Um, and so all four sides of the gallery are, are, are hung in a particular way. Throughout his life, Barnes was constantly changing this hanging, but up upon death, uh, it was determined that the, that the hanging would never change. And so our assignment really is to never change this hanging. Um, this is also where uh, people who take classes currently uh, in Marion, in the Barnes method, they will meet during hours when the public is not allowed in and sit in these rooms and um, talk about the, really the sort of formal characteristics of the painting. Um, I think for many people it's, who's, who've taken the Barnes class, it's a, it's a very life-changing experience because I think what they're really doing is not looking, uh, really looking at um, color and line and really n not attempting to sort of fit the painting within a framework of history, but really trying to look at it as, as a series of formal compositions. Formal and sensual co compositions. So one zooms in and can find uh, extraordinary objects, uh, again, juxtaposed from different eras, but largely a an impressionist collection. And there are 22 rooms, as I said, on two levels of different sizes. Um, some of the elements here, we'll talk about them later, uh, what to do uh, and, and what, what our assignment actually was as the, and why we actually are, have taken on this assignment. Well, here's an image of the, of the, of the land outside, uh, the, the property outside uh, the Marion uh, estate, and it will remain an arboretum. Uh, the building will remain there in Marion. Uh, the arboretum cl has, cl there are classes in the study of horticultural that take place there and will continue to take place there. But today, the, the, or at this time, the, the general viewership of, of the collection are people who can take the time, uh, who are probably mature enough and wealthy enough and knowledgeable enough to take the time to go into Marion and to uh, sign up for the classes or for the tour that permits 200 people at any time into the galleries. They're small and they're dense and there are objects along the walls 
And so it's turned out that it's not really the audience that Dr. Barnes had imagined, but it's actually a very elite audience. And part of the reasons that the Barnes is, Barnes is going to move and must move is really to open up this collection to a much larger audience. We believe that it's a, in many ways much closer to, to move to Philadelphia is much closer to the ideal uh, of education that uh, Dr. Barnes believed in. Um, but there are obviously people of very, very strong feelings, um, and uh, this continues um, in many ways to be controversial and a rather hot potato. potato. But the um, Art Commission of Philadelphia has um, unanimously approved the latest plans, and um, actually we've broken ground. Uh, interestingly, when the Barnes was in Marion, they were never able to really have the the viewership because parking was difficult and actually the uh, neighbors who were really the many of the people who could visit the barns were not contributing to the the financial well-being of the barns and so by the end of the late uh, 1900 uh, 1920th century uh, they were losing the barns was losing five hundred thousand dollars a year and yet unable to sell any work of art of course th that was certainly not the intention well here's an image of of the Barnes collection today. It's not terribly far from downtown Philadelphia, but the new move will put it along the Benjamin Franklin Parkway. And at the end of the Frank Benjamin Franklin Parkway is the great Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, next to that, the uh, Perlman uh, Building, which has just been uh, at, just been renovated. We have the Rodin Museum. We have the uh, Philadelphia Free Library, which is founded by Benjamin Franklin, the great Franklin Institute, um, and, and the Barnes collection, I should also point out another reason that we might have been selected for this is that we had had a very successful building there at the University of Pennsylvania nearby. So we did, we had some experience in building in Philadelphia and uh, some success. So these are the various sites uh, along the parkway. An axial site, uh, the building, a building was just torn down, a, a building by Stonerhoff, actually quite an interesting looking but uh, formidable ship was uh, a house of detention for uh, young men and women, and uh, was has been uh, a, a, a place with a, a very very sad history and a great deal of homelessness right at the base of the building. So this building is the, it was the site of our of our uh, project, and, and the city of Philadelphia contributed this uh, site to uh, the Barnes Foundation for a dollar just to be able to have them as part of the Parkway Ensemble. Meanwhile, they've taken and built a new, or in the process of building a new facility for the, uh, the, the children who were incarcerated. And you can see uh, this is part of the Fairmont, Fairmont Park, and so they're very mature, very, very tall trees that uh, run along this piece of property, and we're going to keep most of the trees. So when we were uh, given the interview uh, for this project, Billy and I had gone out to visit the, uh, <coughs> the collection and what struck us was that the, uh, it was in fact a gallery and a garden and much of the artwork really was art that related to nature. And so as we thought about it, we proposed that even as it moved down to downtown Philadelphia, we think about it as being a garden and a gallery for, in fact, although the, the, the rooms are, are uh, dense and, and, and uh, amazing, they're also exhausting to go through to see these 1,000 works of art cheek to dell uh, against one another. So we thought as, as the building moves to a more um, uh, peopled and busy location that we might be able to keep that sense of a kind of quiet and peace and almost insert it uh, into the existing galleries. But how do you do this? Because actually you're not allowed to change the existing galleries. So this was an odd sort of uh, image that we showed the, um, the, the people at the Barnes Foundation when we went in to talk to them. So we thought that if you, of course, Philadelphia is famous for its hoagies, but if the Cray Building was kind of like a hoagie because it's sort of rectangular and solid, um, lot, you, could, choke down. you could slice it and find ways of putting in um, some green or slice it and find ways of inserting um, their educational program, which is the basis of their mission. So this was the model we brought to them, which was, um, and we can show the transformation. We, this is a, the symmetrical disposition of the building. We've just, as Billy's indicated, opened it up this way conceptually for education. 
and it opened up this way to bring nature in. Now, this proposition was just an idea, and, and it's not one that we ab absolutely intended to pursue, but rather one to provoke uh, the committee and help them to think a little bit more deeply about how one could reassemble the, the elements while remain, maintaining the principles. You see, the laws of this hanging were that uh, all of the rooms must exist in the relationship to one another. So that one goes from room A to B to C to D to E to F. And we looked at and realized that there were not only a horizontal dividing line between the two levels, but there was also a vertical line through here. And by slicing the building and inserting a garden and let's say a classroom here, we could continue the ensemble effect of going from room A to B, or C, D, E here, while passing alongside a garden or alongside a place where one could take a break, read a book, and learn more about the, uh, the, the Barnes education and Dr. Barnes. So here we had made a, a conceptual collage of really it sort of opening up a wall, this wall here, sliding the jam out to the other side and inserting a garden. Again, we knew that this was not a realistic proposition. We also wanted them to think a little bit about what the origins of, of this kind of art and the, uh, the hanging of this art kind of art could be. And uh, one of the great uh, touchstones for our research was the, uh, the Dulwich Picture Galleries by John Sohn. Uh, I think the date here is 1817, but here Sohn is doing, adding a series of light monitors to the top and then washing the room in light, hanging the walls in, with not the same density, but a similar density. So as we began to look at our, our <coughs> The tools that we had to think about this, certainly this was one of them. Um, so Sohn's own house um, is something that we thought about because of the way that light came in and allowed the objects to sort of live in a much more natural light. Um, we also thought of the Mercer Museum, which is one of our favorite museums. It was um, really uh, curated and designed and built by Henry Mercer and um, is a concrete building, but he embedded uh, objects of daily use because he wanted to, in a way, capture, make a snapshot of uh, culture today, of culture at that time, which was uh, at the turn of the 20th century. And he thought he could do it by using and showing um, objects of, of work. So and we also in, let them know that the Folk Art Museum was a little bit the same way because it too had been inspired by the Sohn Museum and it too had been inspired by the Mercer Museum and that these were all idiosyncratic, highly dense, very, very personal experiences. And even as we wanted to breathe fresh air into the Barnes Foundation, we also wanted to make sure that it retained its idiosyncratic nature. So we pointed out these as examples and thought about them. Then we also thought about the, the places where we have a garden in a museum and there's some wonderful examples the Frick Museum here on 69th Street and 5th Avenue, uh, the Kimball here with its inserted garden, and the, the Gardner Museum up in Boston all have a, a garden idea in, inside a museum. And uh, this is our project at the University of Pennsylvania where we inserted a garden inside a complex, uh, a very, very dense uh, engineering complex. In fact, we inserted two gardens in this complex, one a hidden garden in this, in this image and, and another one, a more public one, just beyond the wall. In, in Marion, uh, when we thought about the site, we thought about what the conditions were in Marion. And here, the galleries look south across a sloping landscape so that the main gallery looks out into uh, essentially the Arboretum. In the new siting up through here, which is much more urban, uh, we have an interesting condition of a slight slope of 12 feet from one side of the site to the other. And so we set the, gar the galleries up on a small plinth and thus can look through uh, the dense trees of the Franklin Parkway while dropping the, the cars and vehicles out of sight through a device of the, the device of a ha, ha So in a way, we wanted to make sure that the galleries had the same orientation, the same, in a way, problematic. They also all looked out to nature. And we're working with Lori Olin on the landscape. This is the basic concept of the building. Here we've taken and we've tried to separate the galleries, the, the collection as we know it, from the pavilion. We call it the pavilion. These are the support surfaces 
and then a light court that separates them so that the galleries exist as they do with windows on every surface that, they, that has a window looking out either into the light court here or into the garden here. And also um, we're, we're um, adding uh, light monitors to bring natural light into every one of the galleries. So here you see the site plan and, and its relation actually to another building, uh, the Rodin Museum, which is directly across the street. It was also a building by Paul Cray. The actual relationship of, uh, of the Philadelphia Art Museum to the City Hall and the sculpture by Alexander Calder's father, I think of Benjamin Franklin, maybe I'm wrong, or, or, or William Penn. Um, and the plan that exists today, and so here, we see a, a resolved building, or it's, not, it's partially resolved. We're still working on much of it. Our, our concept is that one walks into, the, the building sits in the middle of this garden. It's a fairly um, dense urban garden, and it is surrounded basically by nature so that you have to walk through nature to the pavilion and from the pavilion through the court and then to the, the collection itself. Um, we're pointing out the, the pathways to get there. This corner down here to the lower right actually faces Logan Circle and is closest to the city. So we've created a, a fountain plaza, kind of public plaza here. We have a drop off for cars and vehicles of, that we're continuing to work on. This is a one way street. And then there is parking that is required and certainly parking was one of the problems in Marion. So we have parking off the north, north uh, and people entering the site through the north from the community to the north. And then to the west we have a service yard and also uh, the central court that looks onto the, uh, the Rodin uh, gardens. Meanwhile, we're retaining and preserving all of the London plane trees, which are uh, a little over 100 years old. These are trees that well li could live to 300, 400 years old. So on your journey into the uh, building, you'll pass two bodies of water, the fountain that's in the plaza and then the water that precedes the, sort of precedes the entry into the building. Our intention was that uh, when you come into this urban uh, park, and, and it's a, it's that it has all of the characteristics of the uh, the formal plane trees, but it also has something of the arboretum. And when you come in, just as you go into Marion, your shoulders drop and you feel a sense that you've entered nature. So these are several of our early attempts at this design after the very first idea model. This one takes the Marion bar and parks it with the windows facing south, as I've indicated across the parkway, this is the Marion Bar, as we call it, or the collection. Right. And then here, here we have the support services, which we determined would be entirely skylighted. And you can see are taking something from either Renzo Piano's work or, or Lou Kahn's work. Another approach on this also separated the, the support building here to the north side from the, what we call the collection to the south. And we're thinking of forested courts in, in this, uh, this early model. We've been working now on this for two years and as Billy said, are just beginning uh, to start uh, excavation even as we're not finished with our working drawings. Um, this is the image of the building, the collection as it's called from the parkway. Each of these windows is a window that goes directly to one of the galleries that is and has always been part of the collection. And then a series of light monitors brings light into the upper level galleries. A light box here establishes an outdoor and indoor space where you can get catch a breath of air as you move from the pavilion on the north through this light box and into the Marion Bar or the uh, collection. So, the building uh, we uh, have a mock-up now on site, and the building is going to be clad in a stone from um, the West Bank. Uh, it's similar to Jerusalem stone. It's called Ramon Gray, and it's, it's a quite warm colored stone. This indicates the public movement to the building. We're actually not completed. We've actually made changes with this even in the last few, few days. But uh, the attempt as we continue to work on it is actually to have more park and less asphalt or less paving around the building, to, as we've indicated, to enter the site to take a journey, a gentle journey through, so that one enters the axis of the building from the, from the north side as you do the existing galleries and then looks out to the south. Um, so here, just an image of the Fountain Plaza. And as Todd says, uh, 
a lot of what you see as the entry court now has become a garden. And Laurie uh, refers to the Tuileries as, a kind, as the sense of a kind of space he wants to have. And at the opposite end of the building is the Rodin Museum, um, and the building looks towards uh, the Rodin Museum. The Rodin Museum is made of two elements, so create back up really, but actually also abstracted that sort of garden, the, the, gar the gate piece from the building. So it's in fact, this is the residual space between these two. So there's some small echo in our building of that residual space. Um, you can see the building is made of three tiers of stone, and each of the tiers of stone is actually made up of additional pieces of stone. Uh, it's no clear idea that it, is a, um, that it is made of two buildings. In fact, the whole idea is that we have a kind of fabric of stone that wraps around both structures, uh, a rain screen system that allows through the slots there to be you to see that it's a stainless steel uh, rain screen system behind it or windows. This is the view from the north, actually the, the place from which one enters. We'll take you eventually in through this journey. So you've walked up from the Benjamin uh, Franklin Parkway or been dropped off at the entry court, and then you walk through a grove of trees and alongside a long body of water. Uh, this is that image. Our idea, again, is to enter through uh, through nature, to leave uh, the car behind, um, to use water as a kind of reflective pool uh, where you can, uh, can contemplate nature, where you feel a separation with the building, um, and then eventually pass across the water. Uh, you have a, a small view into one of the galleries here, actually a, a changing exhibits gallery as you move along. Uh, we wanted this, this is the Bloedel Gardens in, in the Pacific Northwest, and we, we imagined this would be a, an emotional uh, landscape that we'd like to take you in. Of course, it's not as emotional as we would like, but we've always used this as a kind of a way by which we wanted to make sure this issue of, of the intimate and the uh, emotional is, uh, and the, the tactile is really part of the experience. But if the building that holds the Barnes collection is essentially a building on its own, and then wrapped around it is the pavilion, the Barnes Collection has more traditional um, mullioned windows that are wooden. And then the new building wrapped around it still has a kind of stone fabric, but the detailing um, will be much uh, simpler and much more uh, a kind of minimal detailing. So you might note that the, that the original Paul Cray building is symmetrical. The collection is, is in a symmetrical building, but our new building is... is, uh, <coughs> is in fact, I'd say always asymmetrical. Uh, even as one enters here across this stone uh, bridge, as it were, over just two inches of water, you look past through a clear glass through here and can see a garden ahead of you, but you turn right and enter the building this way. These are sketches of our entrance. The, the entrance, in fact, to the, the existing barns uh, is up steps, it is not accessible uh, today. Uh, it really can't be made accessible in any attractive way, just as this building has a very poor accessible ramp in front of it. Um, and, and we're suggesting, however, that one walk in this way, you look through to a garden that's splitting the building, you turn to your right, maybe are greeted by someone at a reading table, and then come back and re-enter the axis, but actually come across and turn in this direction. One walks around from the south to the north, or could enter from the north, through the grove of trees, across the water, water in front of you, looking straight through clear glass into that garden that we're talking about, turning to your right and then re-entering into this large space that we call the pavilion, the, uh, is, is a little bit like the, peach, the Petri Court at the Met. That is, it's a space between two buildings with a very, very high space and, and, and natural light. Um, crude sketch of mine of that, of that space. This is the uh, block over here are the galleries that we often call the collection. Um, one enters, this is on axis, there's a, a thin sheet of glass here that's stabilized by this vestibule, an abstract vestibule. So this light box extends inside and outside. And on the right hand side, basically, so this is a stone room with a stone surrounding and a stone floor and then uh, clear acid etched glass here that then abstracts this side of the building, while uh, here we have 
uh, wood mullions and clear glass looking into the, uh, into the existing collection. So although the details change, the material stays the same, it will be the same stone. And the, uh, this uh, rendering, a more recent rendering of the same piece, uh, we're imagining that there's a, a floor made of, of uh, perhaps reclaimed ipe here, it goes inside and outside and that's set in, into a stone surround. So this will try in many ways to try to domesticate the center space. We'll do other things like bring in water, uh, a water table and, and ch tables and chairs so this feels much more domesticated here. One is looking into the, 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 uh, the in-between space that we described. Um, this is a, a church in Santiago, Billy and I visited uh, where we were struck by the the simple power of the uh, herringbone wood floor, and uh, that in a very, very uh, solid and simple uh, uh, interior. Interior was something we we're interested in. Um, this is a, a crude beginning of, of thinking about the way the to wood actually could tooth together with the stone. Whether we carry this on, I don't know, but it's uh, today's thinking. Um, mosaics actually play a fairly important part in the decoration of the Cray building, and so. We're thinking about other ways mosaics might come back in, and this fabric is actually a traditional pattern called liar's cloth. And uh, we're thinking of using it as a sort of um, entry threshold mosaic that you walk over before you enter into the great hall. Here we are <coughs> moving more cl closer to that clear glass that leads you out to the garden. And here on the outside, you'd step outside, you'd still be under cover but you'd look out to the Rodin uh, garden. Details from the existing uh, entrance to the barns actually splice together these arts and crafts uh, tiles with uh, African motifs. And uh, as we had indicated uh, before that Albert Barnes was one of the first people to really recognize the, the beauty of, of uh, the intrinsic beauty of African art. So we're imagining that the, the, this element that we have here, spear, could maybe play some sort of role not dissimilar to that of the, the well, it's a, probably, it's, it's a high, long stretch to the great uh, Louis Sullivan stair we see at the Met. The, uh, um, this is looking at the underside of the, of the light box, and uh, we wanted to bring in a changing light, but also a light whose uh, actual sort of source couldn't be determined. So there's a fold there, so you can't really see where the light is coming from. You cannot see the sky. We also, our, our aspirations are to make this a lead platinum building, and we are basically on track to do that, although it's going to be a, a stretch given that we're taking our stone from the Negev. But uh, the, the fact is that we are still on, on course for that, even with this stone. Uh, the, we imagine the entire uh, glass box up here is our PV cells, that the pavilion is a green roof through here uh, that we're very, very careful as the city of Philadelphia demands us to be with the resource of water and, the, and uh, that we will use reclaimed wood wherever we can and natural skylights where we can. So uh, there are quite a few things at the moment, the building, uh, the, the, real quali the real test of a building uh, in lead is whether it's going to be loved over, over the centuries and whether it actually will perform and, and perform um, at low cost over the centuries. So at the moment, we're 40% of the most recent ASHRAE standards for museums. So we're, we're well below their, uh, their requirements. This is the cantilevered um, uh, light box as it looks out actually in a slight ha-ha condition and you can see the Rodin gates out there. So people, people could come out here and, and uh, either before or after visiting the, uh, uh, the collection, step outside and, and again, be in nature. So the cantilever of this, which uh, is a very simple thing to do because after all, this is a very deep beam, 25 foot deep beam that has uh, the, the, the structure is, is set behind the glass through here. And so this is just natural etched glass. You can walk inside this and change lights or, or, or repair this structure. And, but then inside you have the exterior of that folded plane. Uh, that diverts light into the interior. And we're working with Paul Morantz on the lighting, and you'll see more of that later. So it's the idea that this would be a beacon glowing at night. Um, we're not exactly sure how bright that should be. It should probably be quite gentle. Um, 
we, we have, this is the courtyard that we've embedded inside the galleries. Uh, and we've actually taken, because of the existing uh, barns has a basement, we too have a basement. The basement is actually a place one goes and wants to go. We want to make sure that this is a small court that one can step out in and enjoy probably low ferns and tall trees seeking light. Uh, but this then enables you as you go from gallery to gallery to look into this uh, and have a glimpse of nature. And uh, so this is a kind of, uh, I'd say, a, we call it a cloister condition around this lower level uh, courtyard. And uh, I'm sorry, these plans just only indicate that courtyard and auditorium, uh, classrooms and an orientation space and, and the shop, which as an existing building is in the lowest level. So one of the things that we're struggling with as modern ar architects is how to um, understand and deal with things that we haven't dealt with before, such as moldings that are not straight lines. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time measuring and studying the moldings and thinking about um, their place in creating a, a sense of scale within the, the gallery. Um, we've also spent a lot of time thinking about the windows because the windows uh, really were not able to make use of the kind of glass technology that exists today. So as Todd says, they're almost always um, closed by curtains. And, and uh, here are those are the windows. There are only four, I think, uh, three windows or four windows that actually have clear glass. All of the rest of them have an opaque glass with, with shades because uh, the artwork, of course, can't uh, take the light that will s touch the gallery floors. And so by use of uh, new glass technologies, it's our idea that we will turn this into clear or rather tinted glass. So uh, and I should say the tint knocks off the glare. And then uh, there are many other qualities that the glass needs to have. But these would be wooden windows uh, and wooden frames, steel reinforced. Maybe they're a little too delicate here. But we will restore this idea as Matisse said, when he painted this, I wanted to be able to look out into a garden. Well, in fact, when he painted this, he wanted to do that, but the condition right now at Marion is that only these few windows look out to, to the outdoors at all. Uh, there is, is, is the uh, sort of take on African uh, motifs that exist in the moldings. Do we replicate these things or do we do them ourselves? We're imagining we might do them ourselves. We, Matisse was a great collector of African fabrics and claws, and so even if in this particular case he may not want to have had a cloth beneath him here, and, and that we might abstract that in a plaster. So this is a Cuba cloth idea, and, and I should say it's a rather early idea of what we might do to sort of reinterpret that van. But in he, he was, Matisse was a, a great collector of Cuba cloth. So here we're looking at an existing condition. Um, there are a number of problems. The delivery of heat and um, air is a problem, and also you can see the little black lines on the floor that are made with tape to keep people away from the paintings are also problems. And as well as the windows, which are perpetually either curtained or impossible to look out. Um, and so, again, this is at least where we think we're going to be able to take this. Um, we'll simplify the moldings. The requirement is that the hang has to remain exactly as it is. We're not sure whether they will reinterpret um, the base moldings, we're already, we're struggling with the work that we've got here. We have an ugly uh, fire exit that exists in one of the galleries, but uh, we're able to find another way without changing the hang that will enable this gallery to be restored to what we believe uh, makes these paintings more accessible to people in wheelchairs and, and uh, safer than, than to look at them as you uh, descend and, and head to a fire. The upper level of the building, uh, this is the upper level galleries uh, of the present barns. Let's go back, Billy, for a moment. Um, and then this surrounding L are, are offices, a library, more offices, and, and uh, conservation labs. I'm sorry, we don't have detailed information on that, but uh, we're still working on that area. One of the things that we've been looking at with Paul uh, on the second floor is the presence or absence of natural light. And so these are two galleries on the second floor um, shot at the same time one clearly with uh, a clear story. And in the clear story condition, actually, there's too much light on the paintings. Here we are with Paul Morantz and uh, Derek Gilman, who's here this evening, and, and uh, some of our great team thinking about the issue of light. 
What happens here, and this is quite different from sewn, is that this is very, very bright and this surface is quite dark. And so your eyes have a lot of difficulty in adjusting and seeing the work, even if these are over-lighted. Uh, in another gallery, we only have this as a fixture and when we, the shades are perpetually down and so, in fact, they're way too dimly lit lighted. And so, the room itself feels very flat. So even though we cannot, again, change the ensemble, the, the walls, we can change a few of the details, we are told we can change the lights. And so uh, one of our, one of the, not only do we think about John Sohn's uh, Dulwich picture galleries in his own house, but Paul Morantz had worked with Robert Venturi, obviously, Vinci, Con, Craig Con Venturi is an interesting sequence on the Sainsbury wing of the, uh, of the National Gallery in, in London. And here, this, through this light monitor, the, w the rooms are bathed in light, and that's, that's our intention, to actually very gently, with much less light, bathe the rooms in light. So this is the second floor, which actually only had uh, two existing skylights, and here we're looking at um, adding new skylights, so all the rooms will have some modicum of natural light. Of course, we have to squeeze that light way, way down in certain galleries to make sure. So in, in this example, for example, we're bouncing the light off the, the, the ceiling of, or the roof here onto the ceiling and then back down into the gallery to illuminate the, uh, the room itself. Uh, we're, we're going to be working in mock-ups here, but the, the ceilings will no longer be flat, and this is a terrible sketch, but it indicates that there, you won't also see any glass up here, nor will you see an absolute sort of Terrell-like sky, but you'll have a sense of a volume there delivering light to the space. Another area where you're able to change is this wonderful painting um, that is actually inaccessible. It's on a, mounted on a stairway. Uh, the judge, uh, when he said that the, the uh, collection could move, said that really the only possible logic you could change, take for moving a, a work of art was accessibility or safety. And indeed, this painting is hardly accessible. In fact, there are others that are not at all accessible visually to a person who's challenged. So it was mounted on a stairway, and, and because it's such a a terribly important uh, painting, The Joy of Life, I think the date is 1906, and one of the absolute greatest paintings uh, that Matisse ever did. Then followed by La Dance, we, we will pair them opposite one another. So where it now occurs is in a stairway, and that stairway leads to a mezzanine which overlooks the gallery. And here you can see from this image, it overlooks the double height gallery where you're looking at La Dance. Um, we're talking about now raising the ceiling of that space that mezzanine space and providing once again natural light. And here you can see in Todd's section, um, both light into the um, mezzanine space and also light into a new gallery that we're creating for the joy of life. And this is that painting, a rather radical painting from 1906. Uh, once again, here we are studying the existing conditions. The uh, fact is that there, there's a whole jumble of art through here uh, that, that actually makes it a little hazardous for people to move. Either the art gets bumped or the people get bumped. Um, and in the new configuration, we're putting the joy of life into a, a, a space more or less, well, absolutely symmetrical uh, to the gallery below, but with more space. And here our models sort of studying the relationship of the joy of life, of, of La Dance to joy of life. Once again, here, this, this proposition that we take the existing galleries and then cut them open to allow education, an educational alcove. This is, comes from another project at Berkeley and will be done in a different way to be inserted within the gallery sequence, a reading room. So when we talked about the fabric of the building, uh, we were looking at kente cloth, which is essentially fabric that's woven in bands and the bands are sewn together. And so the facade of the building is going to be made of three sort of super bands of uh, stone. And these are some early um, facade models where we're looking at both having the super bands and then the um, intervening vertical divisions um, between the stone so that it, it feels both um, continuous but also uh, somewhat idiosyncratic with surprises. Mm -hmm. Here uh, traveled, we looked at different stones actually that were more local, but um, eventually settled on this Jerusalem stone, or, or it's actually stone from the Negev, where the Jerusalem neither has enough stone nor is it dense enough. But when we went to the Negev to visit the 
actually we're right in this quarry, and there are several quarries where one can get stone at, at relatively low cost and beautiful warm stone that has warmth that actually one wants, I think, with this collection. Here we are studying different stones uh, in rather large scale. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, something called seagrass, I should say. This is a, a Ramon stone that's been finished in a particular way, another one. And then we also looked at Tennessee pink, which is the, the stone that Paul Prey used on the National, Gallery, the, uh, National Gallery in Washington and many of his buildings, including um, uh, parts of the uh, Marion uh, facilities. Uh, these are more, uh, these are studies of mock-ups from uh, earlier last summer. But you can see there's a, a general um, idea here where the verticals are uh, stainless steel and they're set back. And um, the sort of super bands are made up of tightly jointed stones. And then interspersed are also stone bars and hammered bronze fins. And I should say they won't be in this proportion, but we're just saying these are the ingredients. This is an early window mock-up which it unfortunately has the tinted glass will probably increase the thickness of the mullion here and, and the depth of its setting inside the wall will be changed. The walls will really be nearly two feet thick. Here is Paul Morantz showing the problem of the existing galleries for if the light that comes in is not, is, it's already too bright for the paintings, but furthermore, the contrast that exists on the floor is such that it really makes it impossible to see the painting. So if all of the windows are of this kind of a tint that knocks down the, uh, the the light that is so harsh for the uh, for the for the paintings, but it also uh, allows the contrast of the of the gallery to be when the when the sun does strike the floor to be much less. And a crude sketch of mine where I'm exploring shades that we will have both outside the building and inside the building, as well as this this glass. Um, we're going to use three kinds of. Uh, surfaces of the same stone. <coughs> so you'll see that the one of them is honed, one of them is um, hand hammered, and the other one is machine hammered. So the machine hammered is much tighter. Um, hand hammered is much looser and more, um, I guess, free flowing. This is one of the hand hammered <coughs> uh, slabs. And it will, will, all of the stone will come in three inch thickness. Um, and uh, these are, again, the bronze panels. The, the idea, we, we wanted to make sure that the hardware actually was also part of the decoration was somehow integrated and that the hardware even of the system of hanging of the walls was somehow integrated. Now I should say, we still haven't integrated that, but that's an intention. But there's, so there's a sense of also the kind of hardware that one sees on the walls inside the collection. Here we, we use two different, and here we're studying different dimensions of the stone jointing. Uh, nothing here is exactly to scale. We'll end with the uh, last two images. One is of the sort of luminous box. That is something which actually changes and, and brings a new light down to the center of Philadelphia and, uh, and, and uh, a new home for the barns. And at the same time, one that cites the collection really embeds it in the, in the Franklin Parkway. So these are, the, these are the last images, but I wanted to say you know, we don't do this alone. Uh, Billy and I are deeply uh, indebted to uh, the studio, to Phil Ryan and David Later and people uh, in the studio who work so hard on this and who worked so hard for two years. We're, uh, the Ballinger Group from Philadelphia who are associate architects and to incredible engineers we've got. Of course, to, to Derek Gilman, who's the director of the Barnes and to the, the board of the Barnes who've been very, very supportive of, of this. So um, it's been an incredible journey, an intellectual challenge to us, a kind of um, an ethical challenge to us. And, and I should say that um, I don't think it's over yet. I think we need to make sure that if we take this thing, uh, this incredible collection from its home, that we actually deliver it uh, with all of the emotional power and all of the content and uh, to more people uh, than have existed before, to a broader band of people. And that we actually use it to revitalize the city of Philadelphia, to bring art uh, to cities and, and urban centers. Uh, that are going to be really our future. So thank you all.